next speaker, our first foreign key speaker, Jerome Rudier, who is a senior lecturer at the Catholic University of Lille and Science Po Paris, and a specialist of the late Renaissance philosophy, and particularly in Machiavelli, who's, um, who is also the author of one monograph and who is writing another one. Please. Uh, first, I want obviously to thank all the team who invite me, Gregor, Zia, Petra, and all the team, because uh, I'm very happy to be there to see this beautiful city, this beautiful town. And uh, second, I want to apologize for my English. I'm, I'm a French, an old French. I think in French. I teach in, Spain, in French. And uh, Gregor told me, no, in English, it's perfect. It, it will be perfect. We never see each other before. Uh, so uh, I hope everything will be clear. Where I stand, I'm not an historian like Gregor. I'm, uh, I await this afternoon's contributions with interest and impatience. I am an historian of ideas who relies on the biographical historical work of others. So my work on Machiavelli has not consisted of going to the archives and unearthing new documents, but rather of drawing on the historical work done by eminent fellow historians, Roberto Ridolfi, Andrea Guidi as Italians, Jean-Claude Fournel and Zancarini in French. And my work is showing the importance of the biographical contribution to understand Machiavelli's thought in the first instance, my first book, and to understand the advent of modern political thought in the second instance, this work and my future book. For, in, for example, in my next book, I intend to show that the prince and the discourse The Prince and the Discourse do indeed aim first and foremost at Italian unification along two radically opposed paths that are set out according to the possibilities offered by the Florentine political situation at the time of writing of Machiavelli and by the audience to which these writings were particularly addressed. In France, there is a tendency to see Machiavelli as a philosopher whose ideas could be understood at any time and who would provide some keys to politics. It is to mean, if it is to mean that evil can succeed in politics and that we must either use evil or never forget that somebody can use evil, the lesson is well known and of little interest. The problem for understanding Machiavelli then is to understand the dynamic balance between theory and action in his work. The point, is, the point here is not biography itself, but the importance of biography in the history of political ideas and ultimately for our contemporary political systems. My thesis is that political biography in our culture is the story of the struggle between a man who acts and what resists, for example, in Machiavelli, virtue and fortuna. The question is what takes place now and for us of fortuna. I want to suggest a little story of this question for this conference, but Gregor said many interesting things before me. First, I want just to make a focus on antiquity and Middle Ages 
as seen by political modernity. Plutarch, of course, was one of the fundamental authors of antiquity who formed the biographical reading of political figures from the Renaissance to the 19th century. His parallel lives in the various editions, translations, and even various extrapolations literally mark out the readings of this period. We know that Shakespeare used it. We know that Machiavelli requested this book as early as 1503, when he was on a mission and therefore at the mercy of Caesar Borgia. We know too that Bonaparte, who had not read Machiavelli, had the lives in his personal library. These examples illustrate the vital importance of their dissemination in the literary and political circles of the time. Plutarch's works is in fact that of a moralist. We know that he attempt, through the parallel comparison of two lies, Greek and Roman, to judge several things. The moral and human quality of Greece versus Rome, the moral and human quality of each individual in face of his good fortune, and the meaning of human action in politics in front of fate, destiny, and in a way, providence. For each of this man, Plutarch intends to separate the part played by happiness, by luck, than the individual's moral value. In absolute terms, it would have been possible to distinguish the best of man even through the worst of misfortune or the worst of man through insolent luck. Of course, all this needs to be put into perspective because in Plutarch's time, it would have been unthinkable for the worst of man to benefit from too much divine favor or for the best and therefore most pious of men to be afflicted or overburned. The work of Plutarch as a whole was intended to measure, for, to measure what was better Greeks or Roman but also to determine the meaning of this divinity of fate, whose obvious blindness in some cases called into question the meaning of human action in politics. Christianity, of course, considerably altered the scope of this questioning, and the rediscovery of Plutarch was first and foremost a pleasure for historians and enthusiasts of antiquity we were delighted to rediscover real-life heroes presently described by a narrator from the ancient times. We can also imagine that it was an alternative to the biographies of the saints, whose fabulous nature became gradually unassimilable and whose hagiographic hagi spirit essentially made the material ball unsuitable for critical discussion, for the weighing assessment of political judgment for secular evaluation. The Renaissance and Machiavelli made, an, the, made clear the eruption of man into history for his capacity to produce something new in politics. Machiavelli, whose biography forms the core of our works nowadays, of my works nowadays, offered a radically new perspective for, uh, to the study of antiquity and to biography. As he wrote in the discourse, in the foreword of the second book of the discourse on Titi Levi, antiquity, which serves as a model for art and science, must also be taken seriously in political matters. The discourses through the use of Titus Livius and Polybius illustrate this. Machiavelli's intention was to recover Roman civic sense by, as it were, overcoming the apolitical nature of Christianity, which, in his view, has distorted the political nature of the Italians and precipitated their downfall through their inability to unite, 
and to avoid becoming, becoming the stake in the Italian wars during which he lived and wrote. Machiavelli also wrote a life of Castruccio Castacani da Luca and numerous portraits in his Florentine stories, which reveal an evolution in the art of bi biography. Basically, Machiavelli returned to Plutarch for a fundamental reason, expressed in chapter 25 of The Prince, on the respective roles of virtue and fortune arbitrated by a free will. He then decides that everything is balanced, equalized in this opposition, and that the place where something can happen of new, of proper human in politics. Machiavelli's operation is indicative of the change in mentality. Through the eruption of Christian free will, in this no less than Christian author, Machiavelli stops the Plutarchian moralist and sanctimonious questioning and neutralizes it. The question is no longer to assess and judge each man, but to see in the biographical study the reasons for his successes and failures in order to profit for them for later action in comparable circumstances. First, with the Greek's philosophical and moralizing questioning, the Florentine inaugurated a political use in the form of reasons leading more or less to a form of knowledge. This change of attitude is a question for us. Today, we carefully distinguish between hagiographies, which we regard as neither very scientific nor even very estimable, and biographies whose vocation is, at least tenaciously, to restore a man to the spirit of his time in order to distinguish what he really did and therefore his share of possible merit. What interests us, above all, is to understand the relationship between an individual and his time. Machiavelli, on the other hand, intends to judge the successes and failure of political actions. His portraits aim only to explain the mechanisms of the dynamic struggles that form the maelstrom in which all the circumstances and all the players play out. His aim, moreover, more, moreover is not so much to elucidate the, pay, the past as to explain it for present action. The transition from antiquity to modernity here is that from morality to efficiency, in a way. Biography is no longer the story of a man's struggles with destiny, but of the political creation of a state by the individual. The use of politi uh, the aim of Machiavelli is not oh, that's okay. <laughs> the use of political biography from Machiavelli to Bonaparte can just be placed alongside that which culminated in art with Hegel's thinking of genius, partly derived from Jacob Burckhardt's The Civilization of Renaissance, and his fusional vision of the prince and the artist. In Renaissance, the two are united in the same radically creative desire, one for a state never before imagined, the other for forms and practices that are also totally unprecedented. Obviously, the dated and romantic nature of this analysis is not enough here for now, but it should be emphasized that in art, Vasari undertook from the Renaissance to give the public, with his leaves on the best painters, cultures, and architects, a biographical entry in the, into the history of art that presupposed and implements a conception of the activity centered on the master building, so to the artist. The same phenomenon, of course, occurs in all areas of activity in the societies of the time of Renaissance, and Machiavelli's thinking loses here its originality, becoming instead a starting point conventionally accepted by his successor.
at this point, I must point to another phenomenon, theoretically independent of biographical activity. In the half century following Machiavelli's death and the publication of his works, Western Europe, characterized by its Christianity, underwent a major upheaval that threatened its survival and its civilizational unity, the Reformation. The response to what was perceived as an interrupted division of Western European societies was long and painful and took many very different directions. But to simplify, in the countries really affected by the wars of religions, two kinds of political solutions emerged. Freedom of religion, worship, cult, or creation of state. This radical novelty is of the utmost interest to us because, in retrospect, we know that state will be one of the political forms by which political modernity will name itself. In French, the word has such a powerful connotation that we systematically reinforce the appellation President de la République, President of the Republic, with Chef de l'État, Head of State, as if the Republic were not enough. Consequently, in France, no one trembles with fear in the face of a government which is locally logically perceived as transitory and weak in the face of the state, this called monster. The state is obviously not a simple rea reality, but to continue Foucault's reflection on a critique of political vision, omnis in singulatim, it is characterized from the outset by several features that give it its impersonal character. First of all, as a result of the Counter-Reformation, the state has a duty to go beyond individuals in order to better control them. This is the meaning of Botero's work, and this is also the program of Hobbes Leviathan. Uh, it's a, a point perhaps not enough known in the history of ideas, but Giovanni Botero wrote The Reason of State, and it's very important because this reason of state, reason is the word made from the Latin ratio, which uh, is calculation. And it's very different of Hobbes' uh, right, of Hobbes' uh, enterprise, uh, which is focused on the right on law. And Botero, at the, at the, when, when he worked, when he write, when he wrote, uh, uh, indicates that the aim of state is welfare. And that's, in a way, uh, um, uh, what the, the inheritance we have with state. In both cases, the state is significantly linked to rational activity. Botero rightly emphasizes the link with calculation. Through the use of calculation in human interaction, we arrive at statistics and therefore rational and reasonable forecasts that enable policies to be more effective. Taken to extreme, as a, in the scientific political thinking of the late 19th century, and the totalitarian ideological delusion of both communist and Nazi, the state can become an end in itself, totally detached and separate from the diverse social reality it dominates. Faced with the temptation of unification through reason and state, and therefore the restless crushing of all differences and minorities, the liberal political tradition intends to give to political organization but this time called government, a different purpose, that of managing difference to produce a society that is not necessarily harmonious, but dynamic and free. Attention to individuals 
of no primary importance is also a reaction to the frightening deployment of the power of state. In this context, biography provides a useful counterpoint to the ever-increasing weight of administrative and state organization, which is necessary to manage increasingly complex and multiple societies. From Plutarch and Voragine, who used biography as a means of moral reflection on the meaning of human action on Earth, to Machiavelli, who saw in biography the possibility of understanding the mechanisms of the complexity of political action in order to help the actor, to Bonaparte, a true Machiavellian hero, who wanted to change the political reality of his time, to Huxley, a reminder of the mystical foundations of our most secularized political organization, and Arendt, who saw in biography a means of better understanding the irreductibility of political action in human life, biography is first and foremost a counterweight to our political structures, whether we call them states, or otherwise. The power of calculation and the will to forecasting should, in our culture, culture, be counterbalanced by a reassessment of human action. This is one of the significations of writing biography today and working on it. Biography today is a way of justifying our political present as a liberal state in which the efficiency of the state is ident identified with maximizing the individual potential of its citizen. History runs through everyone's biography, and the study of biography, generally speaking, consists essentially in measuring the relative proportion of individual quality and the weight of history in each individual, as Patrice Guenifer clearly emphasized. From this point of view, we come back to the classic view from antiquity, brought to his highest point by Plutarch, perhaps, that the man's value is judged by, examin by examining his circumstances, whether favorable or unfavorable. Biography, in the modern sense, it seems to me, places greater emphasis on the weight of history, where the Greek moralist intended first and foremost to judge men and propose models. But in both cases, and in particular for the study of political ideas, biography allows us to assess more accurately, to understand in a sense from the inside the movement on a author's thought. For, unlike any other form of knowledge of human science, politics is embodied, is live, is life. It should be emphasized that the course of history in Western Europe since the Italian wars can no longer be the object of idealistic, philosophic, or religious contemplation, or more precisely, that the modern mind, wishing to have a grip on these on things and events, consists precisely in refusing, particularly in the social and political domain, a contemplative attitude which would be perceived as passive, even cowardly. From then on, he assigned himself a truly programmatic, that means achievable, perspective to his thinking. And at that point, the history of political thoughts becomes inseparable from the history of human political action, which leads to the study of the state, which is a complement to your approach. The study of biographies in Slovenia is linked to the creation, to the will of creation of a state. Biography, in the modern sense, is thus no longer a work of moral philosophy for measuring the force of destiny and, in turn, the strength of character in the individual, but a way of understanding the possibilities and mod modalities of human action in history. For the history of political ideas, biography can provide a less disembodied appreciation of the history of political ideas in general, a form of comprehensive perspective based on the anthropological, anthropological model. In my lecture, therefore, I shall stress the need for a study, inseparably biographical, political, and philosophical, of the men who shaped this transition 
to this new form of political and social relations that constitute modernity. Um, my interest in the biography of this new category of political experts, Botero, or Machiavelli, of course, Botero, Bodin, Hobbes, De Lucinge, for example, which evolves itself through its mastery of bureaucracy, archives, and the bookish and cartographic knowledge that gives it a grip on social reality, including ultimately what we call, we, what we will later call the static, statistical tools, leads me to a new field of research for which Machiavelli constitutes the starting point in spite of himself, and which this time fully joins the history of political ideas as a current thought. More generally, it seems to me that the careful study in the history of political ideas of the intentions and political experience of authors can help us to better understand the reason why the history of political ideas has developed itself in the way it developed it and has had a decisive influence on real political life. I just want to, to underline that state, the, the, the concept state, was born exactly at the moment when he, he was um, put in reality, especially in France. I just uh, quote Botero uh, because I think the, it's very important um, uh, here to see the quite paradox uh, we have in, the, in this uh, um, work uh, of studying and using biography by uh, digital uh, tools. It's a paradox because we put uh, excessive, I don't know if it's excessive, no, it's not excessive, sorry. Uh, we, we put a very important value on the individual of one people. And at the same time, we have states uh, who brings welfare, well, uh, and we can control individuals uh, at a point we never see before. And it's not, um, it's not uh, forbidden, it's, it's, it's a fact. It's a paradox, it's a, a reality. Uh, so I think that writing biography now and for us is a way to measure the struggle uh, between human political action and this new name, modern name for fate or destiny or providence, uh, the name of, say, of state. In a way, if I can make uh, something like uh, a joke, uh, the fate uh, at the beginning of the integration of the place of human uh, in action in the antiquity is now uh, replacing by the state where, when, where uh, we are living. Thank you very much.